It is indeed good to see everyone who's with us tonight. It's good to see our brother Mark Howell. It's good to see Ray Lynn. I don't know if you noticed this, but it's amazing how much better Tyler behaves when she is here. You know, he came in and pretty much just went and sat in his seat instead of messing with everyone. So, Ray Lynn, we appreciate, we appreciate that very, very much. Tonight, we're going back to what we began this morning. We're looking at the suffering servant and our selfless Savior. We looked at the first part of this this morning, and just notice with me very quickly what we observed this morning. We talked about the suffering servant, and that's indeed what Jesus was. Isaiah 53 sets this forth in vivid, beautiful, very picturesque language. And we looked at these 12 transforming truths. We looked at these six this morning. He experienced birth so we would not fear death. He partook of our sorrows that we could share his joy. He became poor that we could become rich. He was bound that we could be freed. He was pronounced guilty that we could be declared innocent. And he was wounded that we could be healed. Remember, we've entitled this 12 Transforming Truths. If these truths about Jesus cannot help to transform us, then I don't know what can. We're not to be conformed to this world, Romans 12 and verse 2, because in Romans 8 and verse 29, we're to be conformed to the image of God's dear Son. And so we are transformed by His image. Now, tonight we're going to be looking at our selfless Savior. I just want to begin it with this thought, our selfless Savior, the second part of that title. The Bible clearly teaches that when we humble ourselves, then and only then we can be exalted. You remember James, the fourth chapter and verse six, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then just a few verses later in James four and verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Well, when you look at Jesus, that's exactly what he did. He was exalted. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, Philippians 2 and verse 9. And so Jesus was humble. Jesus never did one thing to please himself. He never committed a selfish act. In fact, remember Romans 15 and verse 3? He didn't please himself. In Philippians 2 and verse 6, he emptied himself. In Philippians 2 and verse 8, he humbled himself. And so this exalted one learned how to be selfless. And what a lesson that is for each and every one of us. You remember he went about doing good healing all who were oppressed by the devil, Acts 10 and verse 38. And he, as the good shepherd, laid down his life for his sheep, John 10 and verse 11. So the selfless Savior, the selfless one was and is the Savior of mankind. He is the only Savior that man will ever see. You remember Acts 4 and verse 12, there's salvation in none other. Some translations, in no one else. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John 14 and verse 6. So he's our only Savior. He likewise, when we think about Jesus, he is the Savior of all men, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10. He is the Savior of the world. 1 John 4 and verse 14. And so when we focus upon our selfless Savior, remember we said everything he did was on behalf of others, specifically us. Again, he suffered for us, 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. He's a lot like Moses in this regard. 
You remember in Hebrews 11 and verse 25, Moses, concerning him, he chose to suffer affliction with the children of God. Well, Jesus chose to suffer affliction for the children of God. Not simply with them, but for them. And when you look at the gospel accounts concerning his life, and specifically his death, his crucifixion, you remember how they mocked him? And they said, save yourselves. They said, he saved others, he cannot save himself. In Luke 23, the thief, he said, save yourself and us. But you see, that's the problem. Jesus could not do both. He could have saved himself. He could have called 12 legions of angels, Matthew 26 and verse 53, but he didn't. You remember in Matthew 26 and verse 39, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, let it be so. But not my will, but yours be done. And so he's saying, Father, if there's any way I can save humanity, any way for humanity to be saved without me partaking of this cup, that cup of sorrow, that cup of death, let it be so. But there was no other way. So when the thief said, save yourself and us, Jesus couldn't do both. It was either he was going to save himself or he was going to save us. You remember in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, in that context, remember fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's interesting that the writer could talk about the joy set before him in enduring the cross. The cross was not a picnic. The cross was not his joy. But he knew that by enduring the cross, Hebrews 2 and verse 10, he could bring many sons to salvation. He could save many by that. And so, again, we're focusing our attention upon Jesus he is, he is the suffering servant. He is our selfless savior. Well, let's go back and look at some more things we can say about Jesus. And again, if we don't learn how to appreciate these things, then I'm wondering about our spiritual lives. We ought to be so grateful on a daily basis that we have this shepherd, that we have this savior. Remember David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23 and verse one. And so he partook of our sin that we could partake of his righteousness. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. He partook of our sins. We mentioned this morning that he was not upon the cross for his own transgression. Now, of course, the world thought he was stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, Isaiah 53. But that was their poor concept of what was happening. He wasn't there because of his own sin. You remember Isaiah 53 in verse 6? All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And so he partook of our sins. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. The just died for the unjust. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. So he partook of our sins. Why? that we could partake of his righteousness. You remember in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so again, our sin, he bore that sin. He partook of that sin. He identified with us the sinner. Why? So that we could be righteous in the Father's sight. Look at this next thought here. The next thought tells us, He endured much pain so we could enjoy much peace. 
That's why he did what he did. Again, the pain we mentioned just in passing this morning for us to be thinking about what he endured. And we're not talking about just this morning or this evening, but as we go through life. You remember Paul said we carry about in our body the dying of Jesus, that his life might also be made manifest in us. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 10. And so we need to contemplate what he did. Turn with me again to Isaiah 53. I told you this morning that we're taking a lot of our thoughts from this context, but this is the suffering servant. This is the one, remember, that the eunuch was reading about in his scroll. He had a copy of Isaiah 53. He is reading this and he wants to know of whom does a prophet speak, of himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, began at that same scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached unto him Jesus. So there's no doubt Isaiah 53 is about our Lord. But notice just a couple of verses in this context. And again, without these verses taking us too deeply into his pain, we can see it, we can read about it, we understand it by what is revealed here. Go with me again to Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Look also at the last verse, verse 12. Notice, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong. Now notice this. Because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made inter intercession for the transgressors. Just imagine everything that Jesus went through. And he endured all of that for us, for me, for you. We think about this piece. There's really one verse that sort of draws both of these thoughts, his pain and our peace together. Colossians 1 and verse 20. The end of that verse, he made peace through the blood of his cross. That's how our peace was gained. It wasn't an easy peace. It cost Jesus his life. He endured the crucifixion. Listen to John 14 in verse 27. Remember what Jesus says here? Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. Uh, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. And then he ends that verse, let not your soul be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, we hear a lot of John 16 and verse 33. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. You remember how that verse begins? Jesus says there, these things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. And then he announces that peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's his peace. He himself is our peace. Ephesians 2 and verse 14. Blessed be the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Matthew 5 and verse 9. And so in us making peace, that peace begins with making peace with God. And certainly making peace thus with self and maintaining peace with others. But he endured much pain. Why? So we could enjoy much peace. Look at the next thought here. This next thought, he was rejected that we could be received. He was rejected. Isaiah 53 and verse 3, he was despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
In John 1 and verse 11, he came unto his own, but those who were his own did not receive him. You remember in Mark 12 and verse 6, Jesus was teaching concerning himself by way of a parable. And he says that he, the Father, had one more to sin. He sent him last of all, saying, Surely they will respect my son. No, really, surely they will reject my son. That's what happened. He was rejected that we could be received. You think about the reception in Luke 15 of the prodigal. How the father received the transgressor, the son who had gone astray, the one who said, I've sinned in heaven's sight, in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. What a reception, though. And then listen to the language of Romans, the uh, 15th chapter. Romans 15 and verse 7 this verse, I want you to think about this verse because it's talking about how we should receive each other. This is in the context, chapter 14, chapter 15, the weak, again, the strong are bearing the iniquity or the infirmities, if you will, of the weak. And so this is how we receive each other. This is how we deal with one another. And here's part of what is stated by inspiration. Romans 15 and verse 7, listen to what Paul says, therefore receive one another. Now that's not any news right there. But he goes on to say, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And so how do we receive each other just like we have been received? He was rejected so that we could be received, received by the Father. The sad thing is when the Father stretches forth his hands, remember Romans 10 and verse 21, all day long I've stretched forth my hands to a gainsaying and disobedient people. You would think that humanity hearing the invitation understanding that we can come back to the Father, we can be received. You think everyone would. But remember earlier in that context, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Romans 10 and verse 16. But he was rejected that we could be received. Look at this one. He bore a crown of thorns that we could wear a crown of life. Alan read to us a moment ago from Matthew 27. And remember in that context, they wove together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and then they gave him a reed and they mocked him, hail king of the Jews. But he endured that. He wore a crown of thorns. Why? So that we could wear a crown of life. You know, what's interesting, that crown, that Stephanus, that crown of victory, uh, again, that is for those who conquer, those who overcome. And when you look at 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 7 and 8, it's a crown of righteousness there. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 4, it's the crown of glory. But then in Revelation 2 and verse 10, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And so we have a crown of righteousness. We have a crown of glory. We have a crown of life. Why? Because he partook of that crown of thorns. Look at another one. He tasted death so we could taste the heavenly gift. He tasted death. In fact, in Hebrews 2 and verse 9, he tasted death for every man. That term tasted, what it means is he experienced death. You remember in Psalm 34 and verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Again, what it's saying is partake of that goodness experience that goodness. And so that's what it means to taste of something. It means to experience it. 
He tasted death. He experienced death for every man. But he tasted death so we could taste the heavenly gift. Turn with me in your Bibles. Look at what the Hebrew writer says. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, look with me in Hebrews 6. Remember the background for the book of Hebrews? They are thinking, the Hebrew Christians, Jewish Christians, they're contemplating leaving Christ, going back to the law where there will be no, you know, affliction, no punishment. And so because now punishment has come upon them, hard times, trials, tribulation, they're thinking about leaving Christianity, leaving Christ. And so this is the background. They're being urged not to do that. Uh, you remember in Hebrews, the third chapter in verse 12, there to be careful that there be in none of them an evil and an unbelieving heart and falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day while it's still called today, lest any be hardened by sin. But look in Hebrews 6 now. In Hebrews 6, I want us to read the first few verses here. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore, Leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and his powers of the ages to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Well, the whole book of Hebrews is showing that Jesus Christ is the one who laid down his life for us. He's not only the high priest, but he also became that one time for all sin offering. And so the point is, when you reject Christ, you have rejected the offering for sin. There is no way now to renew you to repentance because it's through him. It's because of him. And if you reject him, you've rejected everything. But as he talks about that, as he talks about that, again, in verse 4, have tasted the heavenly gift. They know about salvation. They have partaken of his salvation. I believe that is the, the heavenly gift. In fact, turn to Romans 6. Romans 6 in verse 23. You remember what Paul says in that context? For the wages of sin is death. But notice this. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, but the gift of God, there's that heavenly gift. Why did Jesus come? He came that we might have life and have it more abundant. John 10 and verse 10. And so he tasted death. Why? That we could partake and taste of that heavenly gift. That we could taste life, if you will. Eternal life. In him. And look at this last one. This last one. He entered this world so we could enter his kingdom. You know, we began with, again, the idea of his birth so that we would not need to fear death. Again, we sort of end with that same concept of him coming, Jesus coming into this realm. He entered this world so that we could enter his kingdom. As by God's design, as by God's plan, in order to save us, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Luke 19 and verse 10. But as we think about this, you remember to enter his kingdom. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? They had varying answers. Some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He turned and said, but who do you say that I am? And of course, that's when Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And of course, Jesus would say, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then he pronounces that he came to build his church. That's what he came to do. He came to build his church. He would give them the keys to the kingdom. Again, the church and the kingdom, same entity, biblically speaking. And so Jesus entered this world. Why? We could enter his kingdom. We could enter his church. We could be members thereof. We could leave this world. Remember 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, come out from among them and be ye separate. When I say we can leave this world, we're not going to be transfigured. We're not going to leave physically this realm, but we're going to leave the pollutions of this world. We're not going to live in the world anymore. We're in the world, but we're not of the world, and it's that distinction. But again, so that we could enter his kingdom, that church that he came to build, that church that was established in Acts, the second chapter, that's the kingdom we're talking about entering. He entered this realm, he entered this world, so that we could enter his kingdom. Turn with me to the book of Acts. We're just going to read a few verses in Acts, the second chapter. You remember when they are listening to the apostles preach concerning Jesus? And remember when they lay the blood of the Christ at their feet, because you have crucified him. And remember how they respond in verse 37, Acts 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They understood they were guilty. They were guilty of shedding the blood of Christ, the prince of this world. And so what should we do? Look at the answer in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 40, notice this. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41, Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them were added to them. The to them is in italics. It's added by the translators to make the thought complete. But still in verse 41, we don't know unto what they were added until you get to the end of this context. Look at Acts 2 and verse 47. It simply says, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So when they heard that word, when they were cut to the quick, when they wanted to know what must we do, when they responded to Peter's exhortation to repent and to be baptized, when they did that, 3,000 souls were added. They were added to the church. They were added to the kingdom. They entered that heavenly realm. Oh, they're still on earth, but they're part of that heavenly kingdom. You remember in John 3 and verse 5, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born of water and spirit. Unless you're born like this, like they were, baptized into Christ, you cannot enter. That's what we're talking about. He entered this world, why? So that we could enter his kingdom, so that we could become a part of it. I hope tonight, as we think about everything, this lesson, what we've talked about this morning, this evening, as we think about entering a new year, let me suggest don't enter a new year without entering the kingdom, the church. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. But all labor outside of Christ 
it is in vain. You ever thought about that? Labor in the Lord is not in vain. Labor outside of him, it certainly is. Vanity of vanities. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. Living this life without fellowship with God. Living this life, again, just doing our own thing because the whole purpose of life is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Let's pause again, even right now. You think about where you are right now, spiritually speaking. Are you in that beloved relationship with God Almighty? Do you have fellowship with him? Can he call you his son? Can he address you as his daughter? Have you obeyed the good news? Jesus came so that we could have this opportunity. He came so that we could hear about him, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and hearing about that, that we would unite it with faith, that we would repent of our sins, that we would confess him as we're talking about today, as the suffering servant, as the selfless Savior, that we would confess him and do what he commands. He's the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Have you done these things? I know the majority of us have, and I know we're so thankful for the privilege to live our lives as a child of God. If you haven't, let's take care of these things tonight. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, if you've had a life, and, and maybe it's of recent, maybe it's longstanding, you've sinned in the past, you've not repented of that sin, let's take care of it tonight, right now, while we stand as we sing.